Conspiracy with political research specialist May Russell. So you just flip that down. Years, she okay. shared with and us her okay? decades of research into political assassinations and abuses of power in this country. Her program relates the news of the week to emerging evidence about the conspiracy which allegedly maintains by force its control over the legislative and judicial processes in America. And now, here's May. Good afternoon. This is May Russell on another series of Dialogue Conspiracy. I was off the air for quite a while and decided to go back because the way the news was breaking, I just couldn't shut up very long, so I decided to share some thoughts with you. What brought me back this week to Dialogue Conspiracy number 219, this April 11th, 1976, was the burial of E. Howard Hughes, or Howard Robard Hughes, rather. Uh, this financier who ruled his empire was described as a billionaire, which he was. He lived in secret hideaways. And in the newspaper stories, the AP, UPI, they said, in death, as in life, use remained a mystery. There's no reason at all for him to be a mystery in death, because with so much talk of conspiracy, so many questions about Howard Hughes, this would have been the perfect time to shut up the various researchers and skeptics and prove once and for all that the government is not behind these huge giant hoaxes. But they again missed that opportunity, and so the researchers are at work. I was interested in the death of Howard Hughes because I wrote an article with Stephanie Caruana in Playgirl magazine in 1974, December 74, on the burial of Howard Hughes. It was based upon the, the uh, testimony of a nurse, not the testimony, but the statements of a nurse, Kula Markopoulos who in October 1971 stated that she was the employee of Aristotle Onassis, that she worked for Onassis over in Greece from November 1968 to January 69, that her patient was a Mr. Smith, that he weighed practically nothing, that he was just skin and bones and he had no muscle, that his body had wasted away. She described him as paralyzed, brain damaged, badly injured, treated like a prince by Aristotle Onassis and the staff, and I have a picture which was published in the Midnight Magazine of this particular gentleman. And the woman next to him does look like Jackie Onassis, <laughs> as much as the pictures of Jackie Onassis that you see in any of the books circulating at the present time. The man was in a wheelchair, and there's a picture of him walking, and he um, has his head bandaged, and he is tall and thin and being aided. Uh, in uh, 1971, somewhat to confirm this story, was the story of Army Major David Cordray, who said that he saw the burial of a body that was Howard Hughes. He claimed that this took place April 18, 1971, off the Ionian Sea, near the island where Aristotle Onassis lived. The burial, he claimed, was late in the afternoon, and people gathered at a rocky point, and he also had a camera. There were a lot of people with cameras focused on the Aristotle Onassis Islands over there, so this wasn't unusual to be taking pictures or looking for some gossip and stories. He used binoculars, and he claims, according to these pictures, there's a picture of a coffin going in the water, that Jackie Onassis and Ted Kennedy and other members of their family gathered with a priest, and a coffin was put into the water. To further the speculation about Howard Hughes, a writer named Betty Beale published a story March 30, 1975, that Martha Mitchell had told her that John Mitchell and Aristotle Onassis met as soon as they moved to their New York apartment when he was the Attorney General, and that Onassis had discussed a $900 million deal with John Mitchell. A few years later, after that meeting in the New York apartment, we find that the Howard Hughes public relations firm of Robert Mullen and Company, which was a CIA front, was the meeting place of the same John Mitchell and E. Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy. They were arranging for riots in Miami, originally to be part of the San Diego nomination plans of the Republican Party. They were planning to kidnap uh, radicals and anti-war protesters. E. Howard Hunt, under the employee of Howard Hughes Corporation, was out with Dita Beard in Colorado and Denver. He was up at Chappaquiddick, and so was Mr. Tony Lasowitz of Watergate fame. So the uh, story of Howard Hughes was linked to Watergate, it woven in and out of the story of Watergate. Why the sudden burial of Howard Hughes right now? He's only 70. They could have carried the story for another good 20 years if he was getting any decent kind of care. 
I think it had to break. Jack Anderson recently said Howard Hughes is dead and put in a column. Jack Anderson said on national television this week that he went to Mexico to see the papers of the signature of the alleged Howard Hughes entering into Mexico and that the signature had been falsified. He said it was Hughes that died, but the signature was falsified, and yet he doesn't say who in the entourage was using the handwriting of Howard Hughes or why they would use it if they would just say he was sick and we've signed for him. I'm sure that certain people could have signed for him. Jack Anderson did print that Howard Hughes was dead, and Jack Anderson was the gentleman who set off the story of the ITT memo that moved the Watergate uh, team from San Diego to Miami and eventually brought Richard Nixon out of office. The Internal Revenue Service was after Howard Hughes because of stock manipulations and problems related to Hughes aircraft, and the judge recently had ordered him to appear again. Congressman Rosenthal from New York had uh, suggested to members of Congress uh, a bill to see if Howard Hughes was to be declared legally dead. Charles Colson recently came out with blistering allegations of Hughes and Mafia and CIA being one. He's speaking publicly about it and writing about it. The Security Exchange Commission is after um, Howard Hughes to appear in court. There are numerous links with Watergate that E. Howard Hughes had, as I said, B.B. Rebozo and E. Howard Hunt and Richard Nixon, Rosemary Woods, Hubert Humphrey, and Watergate still isn't over, and the used part is the part to be investigated. So used conveniently buried now would put an end to that. There was a suit in New York City by stockholders of Use Air West, uh, even going as high as the New York Supreme Court to produce Howard Hughes because of stock manipulations. Anthony Lucas just came out with a new book of links of Hughes, the Mafia, the CIA, and the Watergate team. There's many books that will be coming out on this subject. So the pressure was coming from all fronts. If Howard Hughes is the mafia and is the CIA, um, Hughes being dead at this time just leaves us with the CIA and mafia together. And then there's the big problem of governor, former governor of California, Ronald Reagan's campaign, because he's re is managed by former Governor Lazal of Nevada, who was one of the gentlemen who brought the alleged Howard Hughes, I say the non-existent Hughes, into Nevada. And this was a case where a person not seen by anybody in 20 years was able to come in, leaving a Boston hospital and not being told what he had, what disease or his state of mind, to come in the middle of the night and sweep up all the mining facilities of the town and all the gaming tables and to buy up the control of organized crime and the mafia and then sweep out exactly four years from the day he came just as mysteriously without any single person in town seeing their silent owner. It's like the visit, the play The Visit, that uh, explains how a person comes in town quietly to take vengeance upon the particular town. This non-existent use was able to take the town and the state of Nevada and the town of Las Vegas. Well, who is Howard Use? I'm not going to give you the usual garbage that you're reading uh, in the newspaper, the UPI, Associated Press, or the CBS, NBC accounts. We know he was bashful. We know he was afraid of germs. We know that he collected money. We know that he had power. Your mind's like a computer. We put in garbage. We get out garbage. And it's time to take each of these major historic events, such as a Howard Hughes, and think more clearly and quit clouding our heads with a lot of deceptions that have been given to us over and over through the years about this person. I think that Howard Hughes is the most important kidnapping to take place in the United States and that this hoax is the most devilish hoax perpetuated upon the American people. Patty Hearst wasn't the first American political kidnapping Howard Hughes was. Why did they do it and how could they do it? He was 19 years old, he was imaginative, he was a genius, an inventor. He inherited the drill his father did that pumps oil, the most important instrument of the 20th century because every nation that isn't industrialized wants to become, and every nation wants uh, oil. They need oil to become industrialized. Outside of telephone, electricity, and the wheel, I imagine that the invention of the drill to get the oil has to be one of the major inventions of the, this century, and it had far-reaching effects. It fell into the hands of an adventuresome individual he was an orphan when he was 19. He liked to fly planes. He kept strange hours. He mingled with a lot of sexy, attractive actresses and women. He loved making moves in Hollywood. The court allowed him to keep control of the used oil drill. 
and he was ripe for kidnapping, as are many inventors in the United States of America who are kidnapped, and their inventions are used. He made a major contribution in the flying field and in inventions of various kinds related to communications and flying. The satellite system, the government security system, the worldwide communication systems, the sports empire, TV and radio empire, warfare industries, secret clandestine operations were put in the hands of the U.S. empire, and the U.S. secrecy began to develop. The excuse of using this man as a front for all of this concentration of power and wealth was that he was shy. He had been in four plane crashes. They could say he was afraid of germs because of the injury to his lungs, which was true. And maybe he was embarrassed by his face being scratched up, which is possibly true. And by taking this person who was spoiled, who had idiosyncrasies, who was a genius, they could combine the United States government, the U.S. Empire, the CIA, the Lockheed compound, combine it with members of organized crime to become the nucleus of the Cold War, the Hot War against World War Three, against the free people of the world, and it started after World War II, 1945 to the present, was controlled by manipulation through Lockheed, through the U.S. Empire, through the National Security Council, Alan Dulles, and the powers that be in Washington. Howard Hughes was a super spy front, and he cooperated, and when he was no longer useful, the powers that be knew what to do with him. There's a book that I've quoted on KLRB before called Howard, the Amazing Hughes by Noah Dietrich, Fawcett Publications, 1972. By 1953, Howard Hughes was goofing off. He was used during the war years. He was important to designing airplanes. He, and I say he liked to make the movies and he liked Hollywood. But the Hughes empire had already become the front for the entire security of the United States through its satellite communication system. And I'm quoting from this book, uh, The Amazing Mr. Hughes. Uh, this is page 266. The Pentagon had become increasingly concerned with reports of troubles at Hughes aircraft now. With the mass exit of their top management, there was a lot of alarm. The new Republican administration took office in 1953. This is with uh, Eisenhower's president, Richard Nixon's vice president. And guess who turned up to be appointed Secretary of the Air Force? Harold Talbot. This was the same Harold Talbot who tried to replace, to put his dead brother on the TWA board of directors. He requested to replace his dead brother on the board of directors of TWA, the same one who turned his nose down when Howard Hughes offered him $25,000 contribution to the Dewey campaign in 48. Talbot came flying out to California with fire in his eyes. The meeting was at the summit. The meeting at the summit took place and Howard Hughes rented a bungalow at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Present were Howard Hughes, Secretary of the Air Force, Mr. Talbot, Noah Dietrich, and Roger Lewis, then Assistant Secretary of the Air Force. And this is what Mr. Talbot said. You personally, Mr. Hughes, have wrecked a great industrial establishment with gross mismanagement. I don't give a damn what happens to you, but I'm concerned for this country. The United States is wholly dependent, wholly dependent on Hughes aircraft for its vital defense system. It would take at least one year to set up alternative sources and supply, and that could be a national tragedy. Either sell Hughes aircraft to Lockheed or accept a new management that I myself will designate. Well, what did Howard Hughes do? He didn't sell Hughes aircraft to Lockheed, and this was 1953. But in 1957, four years later, the Hughes Medical Foundation was founded in Miami, Florida. And why more congressmen haven't gone into the Hughes Medical Foundation, I will not know, except for the fact that Hughes did fund many, many people in Congress and there has to be no other explanation for this dead silence on the Hughes Medical Foundation. This was founded as a tax gimmick for Howard Hughes in 1957, but it was worse than that because one of the first things it did when it was founded was to have Dr. Vern Mason declare Howard Hughes mentally incompetent. Now, this is one of the books on Howard Hughes. Uh, he had been going pretty well for 19 years, and he was told by the Secretary of the Air Force, we don't give a damn about you. That's pretty strong language. We don't give a damn what happens to you, but the entire security of the United States is in use. And he, they said it would take at least a year. 
and four years later the Hughes Medical Foundation was founded. Now what is the Hughes Medical Foundation? It collected millions and millions and millions of dollars, tax-free dollars that were used for whatever purposes they want. We've never heard of one discovery that's never that's come out of there or one doctor that's come out of there. The money was taken from the Howard Hughes profits and put into the Medical Foundation and then it went back for political payoffs. Very little of it is medical. Most of it is non-medical and a lot of it is political. When Howard Hughes died this last week, there was an article, Use Huge Estate May Beat the Tax. The money, money went to medical research. 77% of the used money could be taxed. The Treasury Department will lose between 6 and $10 million because most of the estate of Howard Hughes will go to the medical foundation, which in turn goes back to political payoffs, very little medical. Now, the Hughes, Howard Hughes was the sole trustee of the Institute and he was president of Hughes Aircraft. The article in the Associated Press this week said, in quotes, nobody appears to question the Institute. It has engaged in legitimate and valid research, including programs for kidney transplants. Now, Howard Hughes allegedly died of chronic renal disease, which is kidney failure. His money, millions, went into the Medical Institute. Don't you think it's strange that Howard Hughes, who is six foot two tall, allegedly died of a kidney malfunction that took a long time to get him in the shape that he was down to 90 pounds, and the specialists from the Hughes Medical Foundation weren't called in to treat him, even though he was living in the Bahamas only miles away from the Institute while he was wasting away. He died in Acapulco, but he was only moved there shortly. The Institute that he was putting maybe $500 million to in Miami was just not many miles away from the hotel where he was wasting away of a kidney disease. And we're supposed to believe that those doctors there are really doctors or wouldn't they have taken care of Howard Hughes? The um, Medical Institute is supposed to be as a functioning in kidney malfunction. And yet when Howard Hughes died of this kidney malfunction, he was accompanied to a hospital in Houston, Texas with two men. One was an 84-year-old surgeon from Los Angeles who could not give him any help for that kidney. He didn't even mention about the kidney. And another doctor whose specialty was not given in the newspaper. They allowed this man to arrive at a hospital weighing 90 pounds with a kidney disease. And he's supposed to have given $500 million to a medical institute that specializes in kidney disease. The doctor that took care of him, or not took care of him, but uh, carried the press conference after the autopsy at the hospital in Houston, said he appeared to have been bedridden for some time. I can't divulge the how. I can only say that the evidence was there. The Hughes Medical Institute in Miami, uh, as I say, only uses a small part of its funds for medical research. It is the center of the Hughes Aircraft in Culver City. Hughes Aircraft got $1.4 billion in government contracts in 1975. They have large cost overruns. There's no competitive bidding to save the taxpayers. The profits are not taxed. They go back into the institute and they go back to the politicians that go back to give them the same contracts. It's a recycling of money into this use operation, if you see what I mean. He gets $1.4 billion this last year for contracts that have huge overcosts with no accountability. So maybe we're losing $2 billion right there that would go to somebody else uh, competing on the market. The profits go to the medical foundation that go back to the politicians. They go back to dummy fronts and White House plumbers and CIA public relation firms. And now his large amount of money that he leaves can go to the Hughes Medical Foundation. And once again, the taxpayers will be ripped off of millions and millions of dollars because there won't be an inheritance tax on the Hughes estate. When our Hughes died, there were very new commentators in Los Angeles making snide remarks. Uh, we better investigate the Howard Hughes death or there will be Mark Lanes amongst us. You know what the Mark Lane name means. It means people that investigate conspiracies. And as much as I don't like Mark Lane personally, his name has become a household word for his work in Rush to Judgment, uh, the book on the John Kennedy assassination and the movie Executive Action. And Mark has been working hard in Congress to open up the investigations of these assassinations. The researchers are having a problem 
of getting their credibility across, obviously, because when we take hard evidence to members of Congress to open up the investigations and assassinations, and Congress has the hard evidence, then they go to the Rules Committee, where nine members of a Rules Committee can say, close all investigations on the assassinations. And that cuts off all investigations, as nine people can end all the research we've done. Now, they not only cut that off, but Congressman F.B. Sisk from Fresno in California said it is better for America to look ahead rather than behind, even if there was a conspiracy in the JFK case. Now, I'm bringing this up because the Howard Hughes story runs into the JFK case, into the Robert Kennedy assassination, the Martin Luther King assassination, even the Wallace shooting. There are links to the Hughes organization and the CIA and the crime syndicate, Mafia and Lockheed, all interwoven so that a healthy paranoia about who Howard Hughes is or who would murder him or who would cover him to keep this money perpetuating is very important. The researchers into these assassinations, whether it's John Kennedy or the Wallace shooting, killing of John Kennedy or the Wallace shooting, or the death of Howard Hughes are stymied because the evidence is locked up in secrecy, yet the aspersions, oh, it's another Mark Lane come along. They have the right to criticize or insult investigators but they don't have the courage to prove us wrong by opening up the information and putting the mysteries to rest. Now, the same thing happened with the death of Howard Hughes because I had published the story that he was buried in 71. I was interested to see how this, this would affect the news, how they would handle this dead body if he had a lot of inspection, identification. The first accounts when Howard Hughes died were Howard Hughes died on a plane Two doctors accompanied him to, Mex to Houston from Mexico. The doctors were not identified. Uh, Hospital Vice President Larry Mathis said the cause of death was unknown. This is for the first 24 hours. Even though Hughes allegedly had medical teams with him during his 20 years absence from public life, at all times, so they had to know his body, they had to know his medical problems. Even if he couldn't urinate or he had his kidney malfunction or whatever, he has been surrounded with medical teams and uh, oxygen and plasma and all kinds of medical help ever since uh, he's been out of public circulation, particularly since 1966 when he was supposed to have left the Boston Hospital. He would have had the day-to-day -day medical account. Otherwise, this is criminal murder of a 90-year-old person starved to death in a room, emaciated, who either is or is not used. It's a clear-cut case of murder uh, by just starving him off. Because if he was under medical care and then his kidneys failed one hour from Houston, it would be easy to say the cause of the death. But for 24 hours, we were told there was no, no reason to suggest how he died. It will go into the medical record, and then the doctors wouldn't be identified. There's no great secret in saying, this is my name. For 24 hours, they weren't identified. The first Associated Press story also said there were no instructions about disposing of the body. That's highly unlikely. Howard Hughes was supposed to be very particular of every detail of his life. He was supposed to lay down instructions for his death that were mentioned in several books. He kept uh, accounts of everything and written memos or called people all the time and was isolated, afraid of germs and afraid of accidents. So it's very unlikely or hard to believe unless it would be impossible for him to write a will in the last 20 years and for a handwriting expert these days to identify it, I don't believe that uh, it would be possible to come out with no instructions about his death. Voice prints or a written memo of some kind, or else he's been dead or dying or kept tubed up in some place that they moved him back and forth, and then these people should be prosecuted for the kidnapping and for the torture and for not putting him in a hospital that was just a few miles away from where he was. I don't believe that this man died this way with no instructions unless they've kept somebody in his place and then they couldn't produce the voice of the handprints. Why the secrecy after Howard used death? Again, they make fun of, say, Mark Lane or myself. I'm written up in some of these magazines as a demon, a demonologist. Uh, they cast aspersions on our research. Why don't they prove us totally wrong or to prove me wrong in the used story? Uh, by doing away with secrecy after his death. I can understand it when he was alive. He was bashful. Number one, he was bashful. And two, he was afraid of germs. But shyness and germs leave when the earth re body receives the earth. And I don't think that this secrecy was justified considering 
how many books and articles and allegations there were about this man from his closest aides, I don't think it was justified. The building was order sealed off before he arrived, and, and according to the officials, they were told it was top secret that everyone was to be cleared out of that building. A woman employee, a federal agent, was sent to identify the body because it came from Mexico across the border to the USA, and all she could say was, it was an old man, but I didn't see the face because it was turned away. Her job was to see the face. Most corpses are not bashful in death. The face is usually straight up, or we think of it that way. And if her job was to see it, if she just said there's a dead man, that's all she's supposed to do. But she looked at this body, and the head was turned away, and it went through whatever customs dead people have to go through between Mexico and Houston. Another person who was called as a witness was Fire Chief Whitey Martin. Always a little human interest stories, you know, around Oswald or Surhan or these various conspiracies. His story was, I saw a glimpse of him, an elderly gentleman, any ordinary old gentleman. This was the description several times given, any ordinary old gentleman. And I wonder if uh, after the slasher was through on Skid Row in Los Angeles, knowing the expertise of Chief of Police Ed Davis in the criminal conspiracy section, if they just couldn't pick up some old wino who was tall like Howard Hughes, six foot two, and if he had drunk and had enough drinks in his life, um, maybe the kidney would malfunction and maybe they would pick up somebody and substitute him for the same age if they didn't have this double prepared all along for this exit from the earth and let him grow his beard and deprive him of all food until he gets emaciated. The uh, description of several people was ordinary old gentleman. Uh, that's what he was, and that's, I don't know how they expected him to look, but this is what they all said. Uh, the Whitey Martin said that uh, he, he didn't really know who Hughes was, and therefore why did they even quote the man? Hughes hasn't been seen in 20 years, and he bought up all the pictures of himself and had them, the others destroyed of everything from the time that he was young. I think the last pictures were the hearings of Senator Brewster in Washington, D.C. So why ask why you Martin, a fireman, about E. Howard Hughes, except that he's not the person who would be under oath for kidnapping him or murdering him, and therefore uh, it's a human interest story. The federal internal revenue agents were ordered by Secretary of Treasury Simon to be out there and to watch the body for reasons which he said he had. The federal internal revenue agents were ordered to be near or around the body, and yet none were visible during the autopsy. They were not near or around the body. Dr. McIntosh, chief of internal medicine at the hospital where Hughes was taken, gave a press interview, but the physician who performed the autopsy was absent from every press conference. His name is Dr. Jack Titus, the chief pathologist. He said he was too busy to appear at a news conference. Here's the second wealthiest man in the world, the speculation about him being kidnapped or murdered. He hasn't been seen in 20 years. It's a chance for the federal government to prove that they are not conspirators. They get put Dr. Titus out there and describe what he saw, but the chief pathologist would not be accountable for saying it. Also absent were the two doctors and the administrative aide who accompanied Jews from Mexico to Texas. They remained anonymous for 24 hours. Their names were Dr. Wilbur, S. Thane from Logan, Utah, and Lawrence Chafiff, 84 years old, 84-year-old general surgeon from L.A. Now, Hughes was a shriveled up, 90-pound, 70-year-old man, and here's a doctor 14 years older who accompanied him and was in good condition, and that Hughes could have the best medical care in the world. So a doctor 14 years older than him was taking care of this old man, and neither of these doctors was at the hospital to be photographed. They didn't give interviews. They had the responsibility of taking care of a man who was allegedly murdered and kidnapped. Nothing about them in the hospital. We didn't see any picture of them going down the corridors or when the body was removed or describing the flight, and they are men of authority. Doctor, And then there's John Holmes, Jr., who was supposed to be an aide to Howard Hughes. Nobody knows how long he's been with him or who he is, but he accompanied the body. Now, on a big airplane with these two men and John Holmes and the two pilots, I'm sure there should have been a larger staff. There was a news conference held at which time the doctors who did the autopsy, the doctor did the autopsy, said he didn't know how long Hughes was ill with kidney disease, and I imagine it wouldn't have been hard to figure that out. The other doctors didn't bring along the medical records, he said. Hughes arrived dead, so there was no need for it. 
He wouldn't say if you had ever had surgery when he's asked the question. Now, that's important because the body is buried now. And if one Howard Hughes had surgery and his body didn't, then there's no surgical marks on it. But he would not commit himself to whether or not this body had surgery, which was very simple because I uh, used to be married to a doctor and I witnessed autopsies. He used to do them in Los Angeles. I'd go with him sometimes and I've seen autopsy sheets of Marilyn Monroe or Robert Kennedy, various uh, pieces of research, the R.B. Oswald, and you fill in questions about uh, tonsils and adenoids and appendix and other surgical marks. And yet, a simple question, uh, did Hughes have surgery, might have caught these people on whether it was Howard Hughes, and he wouldn't even answer that. They admitted that he, the kidney failure starts slow, and in quotes the doctor, it creeps up on you, but he said there was no foul play. Well, if it creeps up on you, why wasn't Howard Hughes put into the hospital much, much earlier? Why was he left until he weighed 90 pounds and emaciated? Now, the question, there's some missing links here and questions that should be asked. Assuming Hughes was live, assuming that he succumbed, and he had this large empire, he received $1.7 million from us taxpayers every single 24 hours. Assuming all this is true, that he talked to his friend who published as editor of the Sacramento Bee a couple of years ago, Assuming that's true, who were the people attending Howard Hughes? He couldn't receive a phone, and he, he couldn't send out letters. He never did that anyway. But he ran this empire, and he was supposed to still be active. Who were the people who were attending him when he flew, say, from the Bahamas to Acapulco in the last month or so? Who Do they have names? We know some of those people that are referred to as a Mormon mafia. Why didn't they go to him when he died? They've been caring for a man who hasn't been seen in public life for 20 years, who was behind the political career of very uh, presidents, justices of the Supreme Court, who has links to use Empire and Lockheed and CIA to all the assassinations I've researched, who has links to the uh, buying up the mafia, the underworld, the satellites, the weapons industry. These people were in charge of him, four or five people nameless, faceless, not seen around the hospital, not crying or grieving. They must have known there was some kind of a machinery going because they weren't even visible when the man deceased. If they were doing him a favor and protecting his idiosyncrasies, they would be seen mourning as they left the plane, as the plane got to the stretcher and outside the hospital when they announced he was dead. Did they even accompany the plane to Houston? Why did, weren't they named for the public consumption to know who these attendants were of Howard Hughes? Why weren't they photographed outside the hospital? Why weren't they interviewed about their famous friend once he deceased? They were dependent, he was dependent upon them for 20 years. Or were these faceless CIA agents replacing a dead youth with a bum from Skid Row or a substitute that was allowed to rot and die and starve to grow a beard to look like one of the many used doubles who was diabolically kept and locked up somewhere? while the CIA and Mafia and U.S. government used the used Lockheed organization for future control of the planet Earth. If this was their real use, did they attend the funeral? Ten people attended. Were they all Secret Service and police? Who attended the funeral? He was put to rest 48 hours later. How was this emaciated body disposed of when the hoax was over? Was there genuine grieving? Were they relieved after years of secret meetings and secrecy? Who are these notorious criminals who carried on this giant hoax, who even at the end couldn't even pretend to be crying? The mysterious airplane we can talk about that carried the alleged Howard Hughes from uh, Acapulco to Houston. Howard Houston was allegedly staying in Acapulco the last month. Although the people at the hotel have denied there was any evidence that Hughes was being in there, the people that own the hotel say there isn't any evidence that he was there. Now, if a man was fatally ill, there would have been an extra flurry of persons, doctors going in and out as there was in Houston, waiting for him to arrive. There was a flurry of medical team in Las Vegas when he was supposed to be there, and blood plasma sent in and all kinds of equipment. How is it that no one at the hotel interviewed yet even can verify that E. Howard Hughes was at that hotel? The airplane to carry this emaciated 90-pound man with kidney failure was instructed to leave Florida and ordered, especially from Florida, the Sunday before Howard Hughes died on April the 4th. When Howard Hughes was alive and active and flying planes and running his empire, he always had a plane started up all over the country. He spent thousands of dollars to keep planes on hand in case he needed them, and he had his own private plane at all times with medical equipment around 
And when he had his own plane, he also had a player airline called Hughes Air West. And why did they have to arrange a special plane from Florida to Mexico? Or did that plane contain that old man wasting away? And did it just stay on that plane? And the Howard Hughes wasn't even brought down from the hotel. Was there nothing on the hotel like there was nothing at many of these other hotels? Why did they bring in a special plane? When Howard Hughes was taken from Mexico to Houston, Texas, a plane was called to, my, to Florida, not Miami, another place in Florida. A private plane was brought to Florida, and it waited out in the airfield for five hours on Sunday. That's hardly an emergency. The Houston hospital was uh, telephoned the next morning and said, we're coming in. But that plane went from Florida, and it sat at the airport for five hours. And they were supposed to believe that they transported this wasting 90-pound man. If he were living, he would have had a staff there. Uh, they said this man was living that was on the plane. His lips were moving, but we have no way to know that that's he, he Howard Hughes. Now, the pilot of the airplanes, the two pilots, were two young men. And once more, they were called as human interest story, as well as the fireman or the woman at immigration. Two young pilots were called in. Now, they are the age maybe three or four years older than from the time that E. Howard Hughes disappeared. Howard Hughes, uh, I, I keep saying E. Howard Hughes, it's E. Howard Hunt, it's Howard Robart Hughes. These pilots were in their early 20s, and Hughes hasn't been seen in 20 years. And yet, on Barbara Walters' show on CBS, these are the kind of questions they asked the pilot. One of them was on this morning, Roger Sutton, and they drew a picture, and they said, did he have long hair or uh, short hair? And did he have kinky hair or straight hair? And were his cheeks hollow or were they full out? And Mr. Sutton gave a description about his eyes being open and his being alive. And he said, I didn't look very hard because we're not supposed to look back. And pilot Jeff Abrams said he had a beard and he was a shriveled old man. That's what another, the fireman said, a shriveled old man. But why the interview with these particular people when uh, they wouldn't have even known Howard Hughes if they saw him? All of this is to confirm the fact that a man died and that he was old and that he went to the hospital dead, yet the doctors at the, the autopsies won't speak up. Uh, Mr. Gay, who's worked uh, for the Hughes Corporation for years, would not be interviewed. The lawyer, Mr. Chester Davis in New York City, the lawyer for the Hughes Empire, would not be interviewed. The Hughes aides that have been with him allegedly for 20 years, night and day, would not be interviewed little human interest stories and glue them up and yet the real hard evidence will you say this categorically none of these people are visible after 48 hours there was no evidence that uh, the media news media was going to interview anybody who could directly confirm or stand by with any authority any evidence in this case even the doctor who wouldn't talk about the surgical markings now these two doctors accompanied Howard Hughes to uh, Houston from Mexico. I think there's some good questions we should ask ourselves of these two men. What medical school did they go to? Did they go to Harvard Medical School or Yale or Rice? Well, I want to know what medical school. We have the names of these doctors. After 48 hours, we got their names. Wilbur Thane from Logan, Utah, and Lawrence Chaffee, the 84-year-old man from Los Angeles. Did they have medical degrees? And what kind of credentials did they have? Who are their classmates? When did they join the Hughes medical team? These are important questions to ask studying criminal conspiracies. Why? Because in Los Angeles, there was a doctor, Donald Angus Stewart, that I've mentioned before in Dialogue Conspiracy, who came to the Los Angeles County Coroner as assistant coroner in L.A. County with credentials that he was a doctor and a lawyer. And he turned out to be a fraud. He was neither a doctor or a lawyer at all. He arrived in Los Angeles, and he did a tremendous amount of damage to persons and families before he was discovered. He was reporting justified homicides that the police department was doing and the sheriff's department where they were cold-bloodedly killing blacks and Chicanos. The police department down there has and had death squads similar to Brazil, Argentina, and elsewhere. And he was making these murders that were cold-blooded murder called justified suicide, justified homicides. He pressed 90, 65 charges, it was, against Dr. Thomas Noguchi, who was the head coroner in Los Angeles, and almost had him fired. Noguchi was going to resign from the job, and the assistant coroner, Donald Angus Stewart, was in the office at the time. In fact, Noguchi and he had fought because he claimed, Noguchi claimed that these were not all justifiable homicides, and he was 
marking those murders and such. It was Thomas Noguchi who gave us a clue to the assassination conspiracy of Robert Kennedy by saying that the fatal bullet wound was one inch from the back of the head and that it did not come in front where Sirhan, Sirhan was speaking. The important thing about this is that Thomas Noguchi fought these charges hard and stayed on as the coroner. He's still there now. But the Los Angeles Times, this is February the 3rd, 1972, had a series of articles. Coroner's aide held as a fraud. No medical degree. No license found. The man who worked as deputy L.A. County medical examiner for three and a half years has neither a medical degree or a physician's license. You see, this layperson came in and was uh, clearing the way for the police to murder blacks and Chicanos and getting Dr. Noguchi fired as being crazy after the autopsy of Robert Kennedy. And then it turns out in 1972, four years after the death of Robert Kennedy, in the Los Angeles area, that this man was not a doctor or lawyer. The LA Times went on to say, Stewart claimed to have both a law degree and a medical degree from the University of London, earned between 1939 and 46. The school could not find any trace of him, even after attending classes. July 1, 1968, when he had failed to apply for a California license to practice medicine, um, the authorities in L.A. got suspicious. Despite requests from his superiors, he failed to apply. Now, this is the kind of hanky-panky that goes on at the very top levels when the CIA and the police department work, and they work with uh, persons without law degrees or medical licenses and give them a little slap on the wrist and rehire them. And this is the kind of used medical foundation question we have to ask. Are they giving degrees? Are they giving a superficial training to a man who just knows enough vocabulary, who doesn't go to the medical schools but is trained in espionage and medical techniques? Is it possible? that our tax dollars are giving money to places like the Hughes Medical Foundation, and is it possible that they sent this Dr. Angus Stewart, because it's hard to get degrees made, these forged documents, law school, medical school, and put them in positions of power where he's in an office at the time that Senator Robert Kennedy was going to be killed in Los Angeles, and this man was assistant coroner. If Dr. Noguchi had been out of town that weekend, we would have been in terrible trouble in terms of research and understanding that assassination. Why the discrepancies in the case of Howard Hughes when the death came down? He's been sick for a long time. He's been under medical attention for a long time. You have to ask why when he died there were so many different accounts of his death because the man has been with medical people. They should have known everything about his pulse, his heart, his urine. He came in to the hospital dead they announced first the cause of death was unknown. They didn't know what it was. One of the two doctors on the airplane said he died of a stroke. The other one took issue and said, no, he didn't have a stroke. The next account was a diabetic coma, and it, there was no mention of his having diabetes when he was younger. Then finally, the fourth official autopsy was renal failure. His kidneys went out, and that was the end of Howard Hughes. Now, that Houston Hospital was told to be prepared. They were expecting a heart specialist. They didn't know what to expect. If there was a real person, meaning a real Howard Hughes, or somebody that this group was taking care of, this Mormon mafia, these people, you know, in control of his body, and if he had medical attention all these years, they would have known right then what kind of specialist they needed. They knew that they were bringing a corpse into Houston. They did not tell them what to have ready, even though the Hughes Empire has control of communications and satellites and telephones, they could reach the hospital and tell them exactly who should be there, whether it's a kidney specialist, heart specialist, whatever it is. They, as they said at the hospital, we expected a body and received a course, corpse. Now, they arranged, it was all in secrecy, and it was in privacy, as is the disposal of the body. They got out of Mexico fast. They got in the United States. Its lips, according to one of the pilots, seemed to be moving. And they got safely into Houston, Texas, away from Mexico. It reminded me of when John Kennedy was uh, assassinated in Texas. There's so many parallels that run through these various conspiracies when John Kennedy was assassinated. Um, there was a big fight because he was supposed to be, have his autopsy in Dallas, Texas. And that might have altered the course of history. But Kenny O'Donnell was described as the body snatcher. That was John Kennedy's aide, who literally 
grabbed the stiff off the table, I believe almost fell on the floor, and took that body to Washington, to the Bethesda Navy Hospital, where the worst autopsy of the century was performed on the youngest president of the United States of America. The original notes were burned. There were two autopsy reports that conflicted. There was the one of Dr. Yim versus the FBI report. The photographs and x-rays, the autopsies were locked up for years. The brain matter of John Kennedy was stolen so that uh, researchers can't find if there were two guns fired, if two kinds of bullets went into the body of John Kennedy. That's the kind of autopsy the president had, even with a room full of people and three doctors. So how do we know what kind of an autopsy took place with, with Howard Hughes? And if Howard Hughes' medical deterioration was underestimated, which the doctor said, who should be charged for that? Who was in charge of him? Where are their faces? Where are the men? Who called the pilots? How many people were at the hotel in Acapulco? Or was there even a body there? It, it's still a shock to me that these people aren't visible, weren't visible at the hospital, and weren't identified. Now, the identification of Howard Hughes is, I guess, one of the most obscene things to come across the news this week, because the U.S. Treasury, Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Simon, said that they wanted the fingerprints, and they wanted to examine them because of obvious tax implications. Now, to me, that's just totally obscene. They should want to identify the body to find out if it's Howard Hughes or not. Everything in America is dollars and cents. Where the tax money goes, what are the tax implications? And can we trust the U.S. Treasury Department, Mr. Simon, to Henry Simon, to be the person to get the teeth and the fingerprints of Howard Hughes? When you think of the links of the Treasury Department to the Hughes Empire, is as obscene as having Alan Dulles, who was fired from the CIA, put on the Warren Commission to investigate the murder of John Kennedy when John Kennedy had fired him because he said the CIA is a hidden government behind my back. To put him, Alan Dulles, on the Warren Commission and have him gather all the information about Lee Harvey Oswald, the agent from the U.S. intelligence agencies, and all the investigation of John Kennedy's assassination. Now, we're ready? Go. I had many more notes here to talk to you about he Howard Hughes and about the Treasury Department. My time is running out, so we'll have to do it at another program on Dialogue Conspiracy. So until then, take care, and I'll keep in touch with you in a few weeks. This has been Dialogue Conspiracy. Okay, and then I'll have to dub that onto that one then. One parcel. Do you want to just do that over? It's quicker. Just do it. Take that part and do that if you have the time. Just put that oh, okay, in the well. I'll, put this on I'll say the same thing over. And it'll be easier, don't you think? Yeah. Uh, it'll sound okay. It's cut short. I usually don't do that. That's, I think that's the first time I've ever done that. Maybe I'll remake you one. Oh, no. You mean of the tape? No, someday if you ever get into doing Oh, it does? Yeah, I think we could just do... Uh, this is Dave Russell, who four and a half years is shared. The hospital I'll see how this sounds. And weren't identified. I had many more notes here yeah, to talk to. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And Acapulco. Or was there even a body it there? It's, it's still a shock to me that these people aren't visible, weren't visible at the hospital, and weren't identified. I yes. had many more notes here to it. talk to That's you about. That's perfect. Okay. perfect. Oh, I'm recording all I do both of them. Let's see. What will I do? You, you can uh, redo it fresh if you want. But I'm leaving tomorrow morning at 5. I'm going to San Francisco. I can't. Oh, I see. Well, no, I mean, you could do it any time between now and Monday. Can I do it now? Will someone be here oh, if I do five do right minutes? Now? Yeah, let me do it oh, now. Sure. Yeah. You because it's fresh in my mind. Let's just go back okay. five minutes. Oh, oh, okay. You don't want to do the whole thing. No, no. Okay. Just take five minutes. Right. Okay. No, because I can't. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah, well, this is would... still...